prayer and then we will begin. Father, we are, as always, grateful for your grace. We thank you for the Pentateuch, for the great writings that you gave through Moses, for the clear indication that you are the God of all nations, and yet you have chosen to reach out first to uh, the people of Abraham, and then later, by your grace, to adopt us into that family. And we are grateful for that grace. We ask you to bless us now as we open your word and study it, and for those who have studied for the exam, that you would bless and encourage them. Let it be a sense of accomplishment and not of, of trepidation as they approach the test. I ask you to bless them in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Some of you just came in. Last chance. Any questions? Before, either from your reading or from the, for the test? Erin, okay. Okay, um, on one of the questions that's about the patriarchs. Yep. Oh, and I feel like I remember in another test that Joseph was a patriarch. Is that, he's not. No. So that's just a note that's saying just the. The, the reason why it sounds a little confusing is because from, um, from Genesis 13 to the end of Genesis, they call that the story of the patriarchs. The largest section of that is about Joseph, mm -hmm. and yet technically Joseph is not considered a patriarch. Okay. So the difference was, yes, Joseph is the largest piece, largest single piece in the story of the patriarchs in Genesis, mm -hmm. but the patriarchs were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was not Joseph, even though Joseph was the most important of uh, Jacob's son. In terms of that time in history, you could argue the most important of Jacob's son was Judah, who we don't hear a whole lot about you know, during his life, but it was through his line that David came, and from David, Jesus. But still, in terms of the Pentateuch, in terms of the stories of Genesis, um, Joseph was clearly the most important, but he was technically not a patriarch. Okay, it's a little confusing to call it the story of the patriarchs. His is the biggest part, but he wasn't a patriarch. Okay. All right, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, anything else? Last chance before annihilation. Intrepidation is not a good word. The word is terror. Yeah. Oh, there's nothing to be afraid of. Okay, this is pretty simple. We've done all this except for Deuteronomy, which we're talking about right now, and then the final exam. This is the map that I have shown you before of the wanderings of the Israelite from the land of Goshen. One of the reasons they had huge flocks in Goshen and took care of the, you know, the, the Egyptians didn't like taking care of animals, and so um, they were glad the Israelites would do it. But look at this water. You know, this is the Nile River Delta. This was a hugely fertile area. Lots of forage for animals, you know, big, fat, sleek cows, the whole thing. Well, when they left there, whether they crossed here, or I'm beginning to be more inclined, they, they, they crossed here, the Gulf of Aqaba, so that Jabal Allahs, which is listed here, is, is Mount Sinai instead of down here, which is Jabal Musa, the mountain of uh, Moses. But either way, they ended up doing a figure eight in the desert around Kardesh Barnea for 38 years and two months <coughs> or so. Uh, because of the failure of the Israelites to believe God's promise that he would allow them to take the land of Canaan. Only Joshua and Caleb, two of the 12 spies that were sent out, came back and said, we can do this. The rest of them said, yeah, it's a great place, but they've got huge fortified cities, they've got giant armies, the, these guys are huge, they're like the Nephilim, you know, the, the descendants of the sons of God and the daughters of men, which we don't, still don't know exactly what that means. Um, but anyway, they were scared of them. And so they decided they weren't going to go in. And because of that, God said, all of you who did not have faith, the whole generation of men who were of military age had to die out before they were allowed to go to the Promised Land, with the exception of only two. And that was Joshua and Caleb. Even Moses did not get across to the Promised Land. We'll talk about that today. Well, after that, they came up here, and instead of going straight north into the Promised Land, which is here, this is Jerusalem, Hebron, Jericho, etc., various other names that you'll recognize, this was the Promised Land, actually the original Promised Land, which went wider than that. It was supposed to be to the River Euphrates, from the Mediterranean to the River Euphrates, and from the, the, the Negev Desert all the way north. But instead of going straight north, God directed them to go a, an east, um, eastern route up east of the Dead Sea so that they ended up here in the plains of Moab. They bypassed Edom. Now, 
The Edomites were descendants of Esau. Edom means red, and you will remember that Esau, when he was born, they said he looked very red. The Edomites are descendants of Esau. The Israelites are descendants of his, bro of his brother Jacob. So they came up here, um, and in the plains of Moab and uh, Ammon here, they are waiting to go into the Promised Land. Now, that brings us to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, the name is obviously the fifth book of the Pentateuch, the five books of the law. The name is from the Greek Deuteronomion. Deuteronomion means the second law. Um, it's actually a Greek mistranslation of, of a phrase in the early part of the Hebrew Deuteronomy. But uh, Deut Deuteronomion became the name in Greek for this book. It means the second law, or probably more accurately, the second telling of the law. Because Deuteronomy, the summary of what's going on here is that God had given the law at Mount Sinai, but the people who were adults back then are dead now. This is 38 years plus later, almost 39 years later. And so we have a whole new generation that have grown up to adulthood in that time period. Um, in fact, you've got, you probably got kids that have grown up and are now, you know, that, that were born during the desert wanderings, that were not, even, were not alive, much less being too young at Mount Sinai. So the book of Deuteronomy is, is a re-going over everything important that God has done for them, including the details of the law, in preparation for this new generation to be ready to move into the Promised Land. So that they know the stories, they know the history, they know the nature of the covenant, they have the details of the law, this is a new telling for the new generation, okay? It's as simple as that. This is what this book is about. Now, that's why Deuteronomy is such an important book, because it summarizes everything from the first verse of Exodus on, and really, re all of the critical parts, and reinforces all of the aspects of the covenant God has given to his people, the Israelites. Now, in Hebrew, um, the name is Alei HaDevarim, which means these are the words, because this, like most of the Hebrew books, is named after the first words of the book. And a very simple process then, okay? Um, the, the, which is a very appropriate title, because it is a retelling of the story. You know, it's okay, listen to these words. This is the stuff that you guys are too young to remember or that happened before you were born, so that you're ready for this. Remember. Only now, the, the um, only Joshua and Caleb will be will have been adult males with all the rest of this that happened. Joshua was, was a young man, but he was an adult. He was the assistant to Moses when they came out of, of Egypt in the Exodus. So he and Caleb have experienced all of this. Um, the The book of Deuteronomy, and I'll, I'll give you kind of a breakdown of this in a minute, is um, is Moses. It's three sermons by Moses preparing the Israelites for the Promised Land. Now. Probably the most critical, and I could have two, picked two or three, but the key verse, most critical verse of Deuteronomy would have to be Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 6. Hear, O Israel. This is called the Shema, in, and it became the creed of the Jewish people and is still recited today. In fact, in observant Jewish homes, this would probably be recited several times a day. This is the first part of what I've got here. So, because it's Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Does that sound familiar? Yes. This obviously is what Jesus quoted when they asked him what was the first and greatest commandment. Now this is the most important statement of summary in terms of creedal statement that the Jewish people had after this. You begin, and hopefully you'll pick up some sense of why Deuteronomy is so important. Deuteronomy is, is one of the most quoted books in the New Testament. When Jesus was tempted by the devil and he quoted scripture, all three of the scripture quotes he uses are out of Deuteronomy. Okay, so Deuteronomy is very significant. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your, of your houses and on your gates. Now, again, to observant Jews, Jews who were seeking to follow the law, 
Tie them on your, uh, as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Do you know what phylacteries are? Have you ever seen Jewish phylacteries? They will start with a cord and it wraps around and there, there are scriptures that are written very tiny that are attached to their forearm and they have literally a little box, a black box that will be strapped to their forehead. So when this says, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads, observant Jews still literally do that for, for time of prayer. When it says, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates, do you know what a mezuzah is? If you've ever been uh, to a Jewish home, uh, if you look on the, the door frame, like you're, you ring the doorbell and you're waiting for the guests to come, some Christians do this, but, but just because they want to be Jews, um, there's, they, it's a little thing, frequently it looks like a tall, skinny two tablets of the law, you know, like, like the Ten Commandment tablets. And it opens up, and inside there will be a little roll of paper that has scripture on it, frequently this one, Shema Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Um, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, etc. Um, and that will be in there. And so the idea of fastening the Word of God on your doorpost, of wearing it on your head and on your you know, arm, observant Jews have been literally doing that for 3,500 years. Yes? I have, I have a question. Um, like someone gave us a mezuzah when they came back from the Holy Land, right. and they said we were supposed to put it crooked on our door frame. Why I'm not familiar with that, no. Okay. Huh. I don't know. Okay. Anybody else know? No? It, it may be, you know, like the old story about why the woman cut up the turkey before she roasted it. You know, and she said, well, that's the way my mom did it. And uh, she called her mom, and she said, well, that's the way my mom did it. She called her mom, and she said, well, my roasting pan is too small. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been that there, there's some particular reason there. I don't know. Uh, okay. So, this is probably the key verse of all Deuteronomy. Again, I could have picked several others. But I'll talk a little bit later about the significance of Deuteronomy. Um, as I said, Deuteronomy is made up of three sermons or speeches that are delivered by Moses on the plains of Moab just before the Israelites enter the Promised Land. Um, the first sermon focuses on, in fact, let me go ahead and go to this, okay. The first sermon, which is the first four chapters, or into the fourth chapter, uh, reviews the journey that they made from the Exodus out of Egypt to Mount Sinai, the time they spent there, and then um, the, all of the efforts that they took in the 40 years of wandering. So it's kind of a, a recap of the, of the trip, of the journey that they've taken together. The second of the sermons, which is the longest one, reviews the law and the covenant. It goes through in considerable detail, and as you can see, that's the by far the biggest section from chapters five to twenty-eight. It will go. It goes through um, what the Ten Commandments are. It goes through a, uh, a thing called the Deuteronomic Code, which is similar to to other aspects that we discovered in Exodus and Leviticus. But it goes through the need for an exclusive alliance as the nature of the covenant between God and the Israelites and how the law reflects that. And then the third section, um, chapters 29 to 34, the third sermon is a restatement of the covenant. Remember that you are in a covenant relationship. It's not just a contract. A contract implies quid pro quo, meaning um, this for that. But rather, God has already blessed you, He has already anointed you, He has already selected you, and so you therefore need to be obedient to Him. You need to follow that. And that's the nature of the covenant. So a reestablishing of the covenant in the third sermon, and then the final farewells. Uh, the final farewells include the Song of Moses, where it's a, a poem of dedication, the blessing of Moses on the people, and then the death and burial of Moses on Mount Nebo, which is also called Pisgah. By the way, it's a little confusing in here, and I don't know if it's because they're using um, the local names for them or because it's a different generation and things change over time, but some of the names change. For instance, they talk about Horeb early in, um, in Deuteronomy. Horeb is the same as Mount Sinai. It's the same place. They also talk about Pisgah, and they talk about Mount Nebo, same place. Okay, Mount Pisgah and Mount Nebo are the same. Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are the same. And they just change names. It's sort of like a Russian novel, you know. Um, the, you've read Russian novels. You, you, 
I could never tell who that who are they talking about. It sounds a lot like that count. What's his name anyway? Um, so they do change the names. Yes. Pisgah and Nebo is a separate. Uh, is it the same name for a separate mountain? No, it's the same mountain. So the same mountain has four names. No, no. <laughs> Horeb and Mount Sinai are in the south. That's where they got the law. That's what I was asking. Pisgah and Mount Nebo, uh, Pisgah and Mount Nebo are the same, but they're the mountain that's on the east side of the river uh, Jordan that that God tells Moses climb up there and you can look across and see Canaan. But those two pairs of names, yes, yes, Becky. So the burning bush and where he received the law is all on the same mountain. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, in fact, that's what happened is uh, when when Moses had the, the experience of the burning bush, uh, God said, go and bring my, get my people and bring them out and bring them back here, basically. And so he came back to Mount Sinai, which is where God, and God said, this is a holy place. He came back to Mount Sinai, and it was there that they gave the law. And they spent a time there. And then from there, they traveled north and refused, they, they didn't believe God, and so they wandered around for 40 years. And now they're in the north, in the plains of Moab, getting ready to cross over. Okay? All right. Um, and one of the reasons why, I guess I should say too, that Deuteronomy, especially, I think this is probably more the motivation than anything else, because Deuteronomy is one of the books of the Pentateuch, which Moses traditionally was the author of, the end of Deuteronomy includes the death and burial of Moses. And so, of course, liberal scholars make a hay with that. They go, I don't think so. I doubt that he wrote his, of his own death and burial. Well, it could be that God had given him a sense. Maybe he wrote it while he was up on Nebo, and God had said, okay, you're, you're going to die now, and you're going to be buried right here. And so he wrote it in. Or it does not, it does not violate at all our sense of the, the holiness or sacredness of the scripture to believe that someone like Joshua, who was also an anointed leader of God, came in and filled in some of the blanks later. That doesn't create a problem for us. The fact that there would have been other anointed editors, if you will, people who added to, but it's still predominantly God's work to Moses and the Pentateuch, we do not have a, have a difficulty with that. So I'm not bothered at all, whether it's miraculous or simply Joshua or somebody else added it later, that, that we have a description of Moses' death at, at the end of uh, Deuteronomy. Okay? Now, um, again, the theme, the key words are covenant and renewal. You might even say renewal of the covenant, because that's what all this is about, is reestablish an understanding. You guys need to know where we're coming from, where you're coming from, before you enter into the promised land. To remind the people of their history, their covenant with God, and of what, and what God expects of them. Okay. Another way of looking at this, uh, for most of these books I've used both of these, it's just a chart that gives focus, reference, division, topic, location, and time. This covers only about one month. It all occurs in the plains of Moab. This is after they get up there. Now, the first part of Deuteronomy, Moses writes a recollection, a travel log of what got them there, but they actually are already in Moab before this, this book starts. Okay. Um, the three sermons, first, second, third sermon, broken up according to where they are. The, the first division would be reviewing um, of God's acts for Israel, what God has done. It's a history. You know, this is from the Exodus. This is what God has done for us. And then the second sermon is clarifying the Decalogue, which is Decalogue is a name for the Ten Commandments. You know, you'll read Decalogue a lot because it's easier to write than Ten Commandments. And so that's the, that's the academic word for it. That means the ten words, literally. And that's, that's a pretty exact translation of what it's called in Hebrew. In Hebrew, the Ten Commandments are literally the ten words. Decalogue means ten words. Right? So, the Decalogue, the ceremonial law, the civil law, the social laws, and then the third sermon the rat it focuses on the covenant. The ratification of the covenant, the Palestinian covenant, and then transition of the covenant mediator, which means... Part of the very last part of the book includes the anointing of Joshua as the successor to Moses. Okay. So you can sort of see how all this lays out, the historical, the legal, and the prophetic, what God is going to do in the future. All right. Questions about any of that? Um, Deuteronomy has often been called the keystone or the critical piece of the documentary hypothesis theory. 
The reason is because, as I said, the liberal scholars have, have made great uh, use of the fact that Moses' death is in the book, and yet he traditionally is supposed to have written it. Um, and yet, the interesting thing is, and one, one of the arguments, so you've got a little background to that, one of the arguments they've always made is that the structure, if you look closely at the structure of Deuteronomy when it's reestablishing the covenant, it follows a suzerain vassal treaty model. You remember suzerain vassal? A suzerain was the king, usually the conquering king. A vassal was the person he had conquered. And so it outlined the relationship between you know, the top guy and the person that was under him. The covenant to Israel, between Israel and God, is very much like that, between God and Israel. Um, and yet, liberal scholars have said, well, that didn't come along until later, like the, the 8th or 7th century BC was when those really happened. Well, subsequent to the liberal scholars saying that, they now have identified that there were much more ancient versions of this, Hittite and other versions of the, the uh, suzerain vassal treaty, that went back to the 15th and 14th centuries. Which means, if even if Deuteronomy was written on the model of a suzerain vassal treaty, or the parts that talk about the covenant, there were ancient models of that that existed before. And so most of the reasons for the arguments that this couldn't have been um, written in the 15th century, that is 14, you know, 1400s uh, BC, are now gone. And in fact, it seems a lot of scholars today are beginning to say, you know, there really isn't a strong argument anymore for why this can't have been Moses. Historically. In fact, I'll read you a quote, and this is from um, the William Sanford Lesseur, David Allen Hubbard, and Fred Bush book on the Old Testament. Um, they were, well, Lesseur had just left Fuller Seminary when I got there. David Allen Hubbard was the president and Old Testament uh, professor, and Fred Bush was my Old Testament professor. Well, the book that they have, this is a quote. After two centuries of critical scholarship, the evidence would seem to indicate that if Deuteronomy is not a record of the actual words of Moses, it is at least a tradition that accurately represents him and faithfully reflects his application of the covenant laws and statutes of Yahweh to the needs of the Israelites about to enter Canaan. Now, all three of them are evangelicals. They're not saying that it isn't, you know, when they say that it would seem to indicate if it's not the actual words, then it is at least, they're not saying it's not the actual words. They're saying that, that even the most liberal scholar needs to, needs to realize that a lot of the arguments that have been made in the 19th and early 20th century against this being, that this couldn't possibly be that old, those things are now gone. Uh, they, they've pretty much been discounted by fair scholars. And so it's either actually his words, or as I said earlier, it's consistent with him having been the original author, even if it's been edited later. And so we can take it as a document that God anointed and gave through, um, through Moses. Now, I talked about the importance of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy really had significance in three different, different eras of Israel's history. They looked to Deuteronomy and the, not only the information, but the inspiration of Deuteronomy at three distinct different times. The first one is the historical event in which it was first given. As they were preparing, in the plains of Moab to cross over into the Promised Land, that time of renewing the covenant, of reaffirming and clarifying and even amplifying the law was critically important for the generation that had not been alive or had been too young when it had first been given. So the first era or time period in which it was critically important was the one in which it was given. But more than that, there's a second time period, and that is the time period of the late monarchy. You will remember, if you were in our Old Testament survey class, we talked about the renewals that happened under Hezekiah and under Josiah, especially under Josiah. This is in the, the um, late 600s BC. That's 621 BC is the date for Josiah, in which the um, you know the he's one of the southern king, kings, the, the kingdom of Judah, and Josiah was fairly young. He apparently wanted to serve the Lord and didn't really know how because they had lost the law. <laughs> Who was responsible for this thing? They had lost the law and they were renovating the, the temple and apparently they read it, well, apparently they did, they rediscovered a book of the law, which we believe is the book of Deuteronomy. They brought it to Joshua and read it to him. 
He tore his robes in, in grief over how far they had gotten away from God. And he instituted a rigorous reform, one of the most rigorous, rigorous reforms in the history of, these, of the Jewish people, in which he, he tore down, he cut down the Asherah poles and he tore down the Baal shrines and he did away with pagan religions and reinstituted appropriate um, worship of God. We believe it was based on the book of Deuteronomy, as was probably Hezekiah's reform. Now, um, that so there was that time period of the, during the time of the monarchy, the southern kings of Judah, in which this was critical to a renewal of their faith and understanding of God. And we believe it was Deuteronomy that did that for them. And then there was a third time period, and that is when, during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, Zerubbabel and the others, after the Babylonian exile, as the Jewish people were coming back to Israel, Ezra especially concentrated on not so much building as building the faith. Not, that is, you know, the other Zerubbabel started rebuilding the temple, later Nehemiah started rebuilding the city wall. But uh, in between there, Ezra came back in order to teach the people what it meant to be Jewish again, to sort of reestablish re and reinvigorate the Jewish faith. Well, the document he did to do that, he used to do that more than any other, was the book of Deuteronomy, because this book gives the perspective of past, present, and future of the covenant relationship between the Jewish people and God. Um, and therefore, Deuteronomy was critically important in that time period too. So here, 1400s BC, it was critical when it was first given. In 600s BC, 800 years later, it was critical in reforming the Jewish faith and bringing them back. And then later, at the time in the um, early 500s, well, low 500s, it's late 500s BC, um, when they were returning to uh, the Holy Land from exile in Babylon, after the Persians, Persian king Cyrus said, you can go back, this was the document that they used more than any other to really direct them back to the true faith. So Deuteronomy has been critically important all the way through the history of the Jewish people, as being a summary and a very sharp and focus on what it means to be a Jew in relationship and covenant relationship with God and how do we live that way. Much of it is simply a, a retelling of the things that have happened in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, but it's, it's, there's a sharp point to it. So you can take Deuteronomy and it'll give you all of the meat and some extra explanation and really get you where you want to go in that regard. Does that make sense? Bob? So there was only one copy of the law? <laughs> Um, again, that's why I, I make fun of it and say, who's responsible for losing this? You remember, you have to remember that there were periods of time in which the Jews were apostate. I mean, they, they exactly did, did not do what Deuteronomy's talking about. Um, they fell into other faiths and other worship, Canaanite worship, etc. And it's believed when they say that they were, they were remodeling the temple, they were, they were doing some work on the temple and they found this, you will remember if you were in some other classes, I've talked about the fact that to the Jew, a, a scroll of the law or the prophets or the writings of any of the Old Testament canon, of what they, the Hebrew Bible, was considered a living thing. If it, it, they were, it was so sacred that if something happened to it, if it got torn or there was some other reason, you know, it got so old you couldn't read it just from being rolled up and unrolled as a scroll, they did not just destroy it, they literally buried it. And in fact, in uh, the temple and in some synagogues, they would have a special room, which was like um, a burial vault, where they would take the old scrolls, the old parts of scripture, and they would keep them in there. Um, um, scriptorium is what it was called. And it's believed that what may have happened is that there was a scriptorium, there was a room that they had kept the old volumes of the scrolls, the Hebrew Bible in, that had gotten kind of sealed up, or, or disregarded, or forgotten. And in the process of remodeling, they opened that back up again, and then here's the scroll, and the people who were doing the remodeling start reading this and go, man, we've got to show this to Josiah. And that's how they rediscovered it. They're thinking, you know, where was it? It's probably in a scriptorium there. Um, why this was news to them, other than the fact that there had been periodic times in which they had non-practicing kings, and the kings were the ones that led the religious direction in, of the people. Uh, we don't have, I don't have a better explanation for that. Somebody who's, who's more of a historian at that time period may, might have, but 
all I can say is they wandered away from the faith, and that meant nobody was reading this stuff, and they forgot about it. Okay? How many Christians have forgotten, you know, where the Bibles are? Out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, maybe so. Okay. So, um, keep looking at my watch because I know you all are anxious to do the test. <laughs> um, so, the book of Deuteronomy. This is how it breaks down a little more specifically. Um, chapters 1 to 4, as I've said, are a recollection of the journey from Mount Horeb, which is the same as Mount Sinai, to K uh, Kadesh Barnea, which is in the desert that they sort of, as I said, did a figure eight around for a long time, and then up to the plains of Moab. And it, it's retelling it in terms of this is how God has preserved us. You know, God was with us this whole way. Then chapters 4 to 11 is a recollection of the events that occurred when they were at Mount Sinai, and especially it includes a retelling of the Ten Commandments in almost exactly the same words. It's interesting there are a few minor changes not that are theologically significant, but that may reflect the fact that this is 40, you know, 38 plus years later, and that this is a new generation. Okay. There are some minor changes. When you, when you study the Ten Commandments, you sometimes, um, you'll get into like commentaries, and they'll say, okay, this is the way it reads in Exodus 20, but this is the way it reads in, you know, in the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy, which is slightly different wording, which is interesting. It, it's not different enough that we can make a huge deal out of it, but it is interesting. You then get into chapters 12 to 26, which is the, called the Deuteronomic Code. You will remember when we looked at um, uh, Leviticus, there's a holiness code in there, which talks about all sorts of rules that are kind of uh, details underneath the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, are like, are like the chapter headings. And then you get into all the details about, okay, now what does that mean? How do you live that out? That's why there are Ten Commandments, but there are 613 mitzvot, or individual commandments, underneath those in the entire of the Old Testament. Okay? So you all read about or hear about, the, there's a guy who wrote a book called The Year of Living Biblically. Uh, he's a Jewish guy, and he spent a whole year, as far as he could, obeying every one of the laws of the Old Testament, every one of the mitzvot. Now, it didn't go so far as to stone people who committed adultery. I mean, it did draw a line. But as far as he could, and it, I haven't read the book, but I've read several reviews of it. I saw him interviewed, and it's a very fascinating kind of thing. He did it in order to have a book to write, I think. It's not because he was really particularly spiritual, but a year of living biblically. There are 613 individual commandments, mitzvot, which are like details underneath the Decalogue. All right? And so this Deuteronomic Code gives laws of worship, of leadership, of society, and of confession. You know, confession confessing your national, or, uh, your national affiliation as well as um, confessing to God. We then have chapters 27 and 28, which are blessings for those who keep the law and curses for those who break the law. It's a fascinating scene. They take the 12 tribes of Israel, and they have representatives of six of those tribes go up on one mountain, and declare the blessings. And they have six of the tribes go up on a different mountain and declare the curses. That's not because six of them were blessed and six were cursed. It's just so the Israelites get a sense that there is blessing for those who obey the law and who seek to maintain the covenant with God. There are curses for those in very specific ways. And, and unfortunately, there are more curses than there are blessings. Okay. Uh, but the clear indication that you have an obligation to be obedient to this then chapters 29 to 30 is the final discourse on the covenant, where the covenant is restated, and an exhortation by Moses, again, all of this is spoken by Moses, an exhortation to be obedient to it. Chapters 31 to 34 is sort of the, the epilogue in which Joshua is installed as leader. Actually, God tells Moses to bring Joshua to the tent of meeting, and God himself anoints and ordains, uh, spiritually anoints and ordains Joshua to be leader. Moses is, is and this comes up several times through there, and it's interesting. We're told that Moses was not allowed to go into the Promised Land because of disobedience. At one point at Meribah, God told Moses to go up, and they needed water, to go up and speak to the rock, and water would come forth. Instead, Moses got mad because everybody was grumbling and griping and whining all the time. And go, he goes up and takes his staff and strikes the rock twice in anger. He's really mad about this. And water does come forth, but God says, that's not what I told you to do. And 
so it doesn't seem like as big a deal to us, maybe, but to God, that was disobedience, and he responded in, in, in human <clears throat> anger instead of in faith. And so this was the reason that Moses was not to be allowed to go over into the promised land because of disobedience. But the several times in Deuteronomy where, where, um, where Moses talks about this, I mean, he was human too. He was the greatest of all the prophets. But Moses, in talking to the Israelites, he'll say, well, because of you, I'm not going to be able to go over into the promised land. He keeps saying, it's, it's you guys who are keeping me from doing this. Well, yeah, they're whining and they're complaining. There's some truth to that. But it was his reaction to all of that that caused him not to be able to go over to the promised land. So instead, Moses pleads with God and says, Can I please, after all this, go over and see the land you have promised? And God sort of compromises. He said, I will let you see the land, but I will not let you enter it. So climb up Mount Nebo, his God and you will be able to look out, and actually from that mountain, which is still there, you do, you can see the oasis of Jericho, you can see huge area, huge area that across the Jordan River, that, it, that was the land of Canaan, now Palestine. Um, and so he gets to see Canaan, he then dies and is buried on Mount Nebo, and it says, and to this day, no one knows where he's buried. It's kept a secret. Uh, lest somebody go and take his bones out and start trying to worship him somehow, Okay? or create some sort of false direction. Then there is the Song of Moses, which is a blessing in poetry, and then the, uh, the blessing in Moses, and the book ends. All right? Any questions about that? Pretty clear? I do want to mention the Deuteronomic Code, which is the uh, big section there. It's uh, 15 chapters. It includes a lot of stuff. For instance, it talks about how the worship of God must remain pure, particularly that it must remain uninfluenced by cultures and their, uh, the other cultures and their idolatrous practices. It, it says, for instance, you must always worship in one place that I will tell you. And so as the Israelites traveled, there would be one place that gets made the place of worship. Eventually, that place was Jerusalem and the temple. But the reason God did that is because if the Israelites felt like they could worship wherever, that's just an invitation for them to start worshiping with other people who worshiped, you know, in the sacred groves or you know, with Asherah poles on top of the mountains or whatever. And God was trying to keep them from that. In fact, this idea of separation is a major theme throughout all of this, to separate yourself from those people. We also get into uh, penalties for disobeying parents, for drunkenness. Uh, the dietary principles are reestablished. There are the laws of rape. You know, what's to be done to people when they commit rape, and actually definitions for what is rape. Um, there is uh, definitions for tithing, the tithes of the Levites, and charity for the poor. Deuteronomy, there's a lot of compassionate stuff in here, a lot of caring for the poor. There is a major focus on justice, for instance. Um, the idea of the, the cities of refuge. The Israelites, like most ancient peoples, they had a sense that if you killed my brother or a friend of mine, I had a right to kill you, right? Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, the lex talionis, as it's called, you know, the law, law of the talon, that you can take revenge. Well, the Israelites, like all other ancient peoples, lived that way. Well, God instituted a very strange kind of system to keep that from happening. He created cities of refuge. Which meant if you accidentally killed somebody, and they even have an example. So suppose you go into the woods with, a, with somebody else, and you're going to cut down a tree. And as you start to cut down the tree, the head of the axe comes off and hits the guy and kills him. It's an accident. Well, his brother might not think so. So in a case like that, you need to go to the city of refuge, and no one is allowed to take you and exact justice against you until you're tried. So there was a clear sense in which they were trying to have a more civilized and just approach to this kind of thing. Yes, Marvin? It just have to be light. Because the head of the axe fell out and hit him, that's why we got that word accident. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's light. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like something you would have said, Rob. I'm awake anyway. I'm awake. My brother, my brother, and we don't need you anymore now. <laughs> so, um, there, there are a lot of other very compassionate kind of rules in here. Rules against harming children, especially, you know, sacrificing children in the fire. But the other thing, there, there are rules against divination and sorcery. Um, 
there are uh, well, on and on and on. Lots. I won't get into too much detail, but um, the the Deuteronomic code. There's some things in it we don't understand. You know, like like some of the harshness of penalties. But again, part of that has to do with us. Um, you know, it had to do with God insisting that they be obedient to Him and that they not mix with these other people. Well, they didn't obey Him. Okay, despite God's very strict rules about what they should and should not do, um, they did not obey God, and they started worshiping these these other uh, gods, these other religions, and it ended up them losing the land. I mean, it ended up God having to to suspend. Not cancel, but to suspend for a time his covenant promise to them because they were so disobedient. So you can say this seems awfully harsh, but as harsh as it was, it still wasn't sufficient to keep them from going off the deep end on some of this stuff. And there's some things in here that are that are hugely practical. Like it's talking about military camp, but it's saying if you're out camping and you have to use the bathroom, dig a hole and cover it up with dirt. It's in here. Okay? There's all kinds of stuff about cleanliness and sanitation and hygiene, and it's, it's a fascinating kind of thing. All right. So, the major themes in Genesis. The first one is election. It is a retelling of the, the reality of the election of the Jewish people by God. And again, as I said earlier, before class started, people sometimes say, well, why did God choose the Israelites, you know, as opposed to everybody else? They're all his people. All nations belong to God. All people belong to God. The thing, way we need to understand this is God didn't choose the Israelites. He created the Israelites. Yes? Question. You've got major themes in Genesis. You need Deuteronomy. Oh, no, 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 no. In Deuteronomy. Okay. Deuteronomy. I just used the slide from before and I didn't change it. <laughs> okay. Major themes in Deuteronomy. You know, so the content's different. I just didn't change that. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, if you can't tell the difference, then that's... You need to study more. Um, so the idea that God has chosen Abraham and Sarah and created a people, that's how serious he was about making them his special people. And we ought to have to remember, the reason he did that is so that all peoples of the earth would be blessed through them. Okay. So election. And in this, God is reestablishing the covenant. He is reestablishing the understanding of what it meant for the Hebrews to be the elect people of God. There's also a big focus on faithfulness, the faithfulness of God and of Israel. Here's that centralization of worship. That in order to be faithful, God gives some very specific instructions. Don't just worship wherever because you're going to fall off the wagon if you do that. You're going to end up worshiping with these Canaanites. And there are various other ways in which God, he doesn't just say you have to remain faithful. He gives quite specific instructions on how you, how you need to act in order to pull that off. And they still didn't do it. There also is a major theme of covenant obedience being demanded. The, as I said earlier, this isn't a contract. A contract is I do something, you do something in return. That there's a mutual benefit that is equal. And at any time that you don't do your part, then I'm not obligated to follow up. Well, God had not waited for the Israelites to respond to him. God had acted in love and in grace to them before they did anything. He sent Moses. He brought them out of Egypt miraculously, crossed the Red Sea, protected them from the Amalekites, gave them food and water in the desert, and quail and manna in the desert, even though they didn't know what it was. Manna means, what is it? Um, he gave them the law, Mount Sinai. He forgave them when they violated the promise they had made right then. I mean, it's not like they made a promise years ago. At Mount Sinai, they promised that they would obey and be in a relationship with God, and then they turn around and worship a golden idol, just because Moses is, you know, gone for 40 days up on the mountain. They knew where it was. They could hear the rumbling. Still, they did that. And God forgave them. And God gave them the tabernacle. And they could see his presence in the cloud by day and the fire by night. He promised to be the God of the universe to be right there in their midst. They camped all around him. And so God had done all of that before the Israelites were called upon to do anything. And then he says, okay, I've done my share, and I will not withdraw my covenant. And he never has. As I say, he suspended it for time, but he's never canceled it. And yet the Israelites, for all of that, continued to fail him. The, book of the, the books of the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament, are books about grace and mercy and love. People who think the Old Testament is about law and justice and punishment, 
And the New Testament's about grace and mercy alone. They have not bothered to read the Old Testament. Or at least not read it wisely because, yes, there's judgment involved when people blatantly violate and betray God's, you know, God's love for them and, and the promise they made to him. But always God welcomes them back. Always God accepts them and loves them. And he is the God who loves to, you know, a thousand generations. We then have the promise of blessings. God had always promised he would give land and fertility, meaning he would give them a people, they would multiply, and he would give them prosperity. So God had promised to bless, and he fulfills that all the way along. The, the only time that the Israelites suffered from that not being fulfilled, and, and it's not that God withdrew it, when they didn't believe that God would actually give them the promised land, God would have had every right to say, under any kind of contract agreement, fine, then you won't. Enjoy the desert for the rest of, of your, however long your tribe can survive out there. He didn't say that. He said, I'm still going to give you the promised land, but I'm not going to give it to those of you who are adult males who have, who have not believed me who don't have faith, who don't really think I will do what I said I was going to do. You're going to die in the desert. Your children, though, will inherit it, as I promised. And that's consistent all the way along. God never repeals his promise. It may be delayed. That's not God's choice. It's what we do. That's what the Israelites did. Okay? I'm turning this into a sermon. Here, so. And a focus on justice. As I mentioned, there's quite a few places in here where God gives. And these would have been quite radical in ancient times. You can't, if you bring somebody to court, you have to have multiple witnesses. All right? You, one person can't accuse and be, and be listened to. You have to give people a chance, you have to tell them what they're being accused of. You have to give them a chance to give their side of the story. Okay? Very balanced. That was not the way things were done 3,500 years ago. This is radical stuff. The cities of refuge I've already mentioned, and also there is a provision for how judges are supposed to be appointed and fair. Now, give you some idea how this, how important this justice issue was. If if someone accused someone else of a crime, and it was discovered that they were lying, they were punished the way that the person who would have been found guilty was punished. If I accuse somebody of murder, the penalty for which was execution, death and it turns out I was lying, then I get executed. Now that sounds harsh to us, but it was trying to make things fair. It was trying to make sure that people understood how important it was that it was just, it was done rightly. And not just, you know, whatever you can get away with, or whoever's strongest. There was justice there. It was not the rule of the strong. And that was very different. And then finally, the sovereignty of God, that God is always in control. We are never apart from Him. We are never outside His direction. We are never away from His sovereignty. Okay? Any questions about Deuteronomy? Bob? Are the Jewish people still the elect people of God, or is it now the Christians who are the elect people of God, or is it both? The Jews are still the chosen people of God. God has never repealed his covenant. Paul makes it clear in several places that what's happened is we got adopted into that family. We got, he talks about being grafted onto the rootstock of the Jewish people. Now, um, whether, whether Jew or Christian, we still have an obligation to be obedient to God. Um, and Part of being obedient to God is God has revealed to us that he has come in the nature of the person of his son. And of course, you know, I work with Jews for Jesus. I've got Jewish, you know, I work with an organization, their whole focus is to convince Jewish people that the Messiah that they've been waiting for for thousands and thousands of years has, has come, and his name is Yeshua. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And so, a Jew who does not accept God's will for, you know, will for the world, which includes his son, then they are apart from the will of God and therefore are not part, not blessed. <clears throat> they still are children of the covenant. And we are children of the covenant because we're adopted into that. Again, I could, I could quote, I'm quoting Paul here. So, yes, and Romans and, and other places make it very clear in the New Testament that God still has some miraculous plan for the Jews, that there will be a time when the Jews will return to God by faith in his Messiah in great numbers. In fact, will become dominant force for believing in the Messiah. Um, we have yet to see how God is going to do that, but the promise is there. Right? I've heard it said, He is divine, we is two branches. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, any other questions from anyone but Ron? <laughs>